Kirk, do you have any preliminary preliminary comments today? Okay, okay. We appreciate uh, the, the comments yesterday and the work you did on that, and appreciate your staff. Okay, and if there's any members that have any questions, okay, and if there's any members that were not here yesterday that is here this morning, we've got copies of it up here. And again, appreciate that. Appreciate the dashboard. I really like that. I've, I've commented to you. I would really love to see see your staff develop. Uh, something that uh, like that for our opioid dollars and uh, and really begin to, to break that down. So appreciate your work. So without delay, we'll move into Commissioner Buckner. Welcome this morning. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for your staff that's here as well. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think everybody has a handout with them, right? First of all is just our mission statement. Um, and if you have any questions, be sure and ask me on the way, or we'll go over some at the end, too. Uh, is to provide for the protection, um, well-being, and self-sufficiency of children and adults in Alabama. You can see we operate six major programs, and then we do um, emergency welfare services by virtue of an executive order from a governor from years ago. Page three is our estimated expenditures and the source that we paid those expenditures from. You'll see our largest source of funds is federal funds, but federal funds generally take um, state dollars to draw them down, but um, we draw down a lot of federal funds. That was the 24, and then there's the 25 estimated expenditures by source of funds. And you'll see there's a big difference in the federal funds, and that has to do with the COVID, COVID money and federal money that was coming in in 24 that we no long, will no longer have for 25. One of our, lar our largest program uh, is the Food Assistance or SNAP program. 392,000 households, 776,000 individuals, and that includes 331,000 children in that. We run what we call an ASAP program, which is when it, the elderly is over 60 with no earned income, we run that program out of the state office. It's now up to 96,000 participants in that program. So those of you that have been around the state house for a while know how much that program has grown. Uh, we operate that on a waiver from um, FNS. The last year, we did um, PEBT, that's the food assistance for the school children, uh, was in 23. We served around 718,000 children. Also keep in mind our staff denies 18,000 food assistance applications per month. So there's a lot of traffic in that food stamp area or SNAP. We also do nutritional education programs and work training and education. FNS has been pushing the work training and education probably for five or six years now, and we were very happy to see that. The only difference, though, they don't offer a lot of support for our clients like the TANF program does. So total benefits issued in 23 were $2.2 billion approximately in SNAP benefits. The TANF program, when people talk about the welfare program, that's what they're talking about. TANF is temporary assistance for needy families. We currently have 5,673 cases. In 1996, there was 48,000 recipients. And when Congress passed welfare reform, that was one of the best things they ever did. And the better thing they did was they left it alone. So it certainly has moved people off of welfare rolls and put them um, in some other programs. Now, the onset of SSI did take some of those off, but we have a huge work component in the TANF program. As I mentioned, we don't have that in the SNAP program. So it helps get people in jobs, jobs that can be careers. So we've been really successful with that. The TANF program serves 10,484 children and almost 60% of those cases are child-only cases. That means it's grandparents, aunts, uncle, raising their child or relative's children, and they can get TANF for them. The jobs program 
came about in later years too, and that's where we work with the clients to either get them education they need or training they need or something that they can go forward and work and make and have a career for themselves and support their families. The interesting thing down there at the bottom is that 2,372 are required to participate in the jobs program, but you will see that 1,468 are employed somewhere. As I said, the TANF program has lots of supports and you can kind of stay with us for about a year after you go to work so we can help you with childcare or we can help you with transportation and things like that, unlike the SNAP program. The next page just talks about the people that we partner with uh, in our work in educational training. We have WIOA partnerships, we have apprenticeships, job training classes, transportation, literacy classes, and mentoring that go with the jobs program. Child support program is a big program. Um, we served 182,325 families last year. Our collections was $357 million and our paternity establishment rate was 98.81% uh, to stay off the uh, not good list for the feds, it has to be above 90%. This, is, I believe, was the 15th year we've been above 90% on our paternity establishment rate. Um, the whole trajectory of cases has changed. Years ago, uh, I supervised a child support program in a county, and at that time, it was not unusual to see people that had fathered 12 and 15 children. We don't see those kind of cases anymore. So it has made a cultural change the child support program has over the years. And uh, more and more people are supporting their children. But the good thing for that is those children have more grandparents and more paternal relatives to be part of their lives and help raise them. Commissioner, can I, can I ask you a question before sure. we get too far away from TANF? But also a partnership with TANF would be our Boys and Girls Clubs, right? Does it, does yes. Are they able to use some yes. TANF to, dollars? To get TANF dollars, you have to meet a TANF goal. And what the Boys and Girls Clubs are doing has to do with teenage pregnancy prevention. Okay. And, and, and they've been doing some, some job readiness stuff with some of the kids. Yes, too, right? with some of the older teens. That's great. We appreciate that partnership. Yes. We have a lot of partnerships, well, really in all our programs, but TANF in particularly, because a lot of our clients don't have mentors, that person to go to if they've got a question, well, what I do, my mother's in the hospital, I can't go to work. We had one lady that lost her job because of that. She just didn't know to call and tell them, you know, and then take a doctor's excuse too. So we, we enjoy those partnerships and we're hoping to catch those kids younger so that they can grow up and be productive and won't need DHR services. Okay, on page nine is child care services. Uh, we administer the state subsidy program. That's a federal grant. There are approximately 41,000 children on it. I think probably in years past, we've had around 42,000 children on that program but we have no waiting list. We cleared those waiting lists probably eight years ago. Um, so you may wonder, well, you'd think it'd be full, but it's not. Some, when COVID came, people were scared and they took their children out of childcare. A lot of them did. And a lot of them, some of them are still scared to put them back in childcare at such an early age. So I think that's, why that number has gone down. Subsidies average $524 per month per child. Now that's an average including after school care because we do do subsidies for after school care too. Last year, $262 million was paid to providers um, for child care slots from the state. We also license and inspect those child care providers. Um, You'll see on page 10, currently we have um, about 1,326 licensed centers and we have 565 licensed homes. And we are one of about seven states that allows uh, exempt childcare facilities, but you do have to register with us for an exempt facility. And there are 472 of those in the state. 
there was a time several years ago that there was more exempt facilities or almost more than there were licensed facilities, uh, which was, was pretty scary to a lot of the child care advocates across the state. But with um, the federal funds that came and the law that said you have to be a licensed center in order to receive state or federal money, that changed a lot and a lot of people decided to get licensed. And some of them really didn't need to do much to get licensed. They were they had really good centers anyway. Mr. Chair, um, I have a question. Can can you define exempt just for ex an exempt center is a center affiliated with a ministry, I believe is the word that's used in the code. It doesn't say church. It says a ministry. Most ministries are with churches, but you know, being from DHR, there are some other ministries that you wouldn't think were affiliated with the church too sometimes. I don't know of any of those operating child care. We deal with them on the child welfare side sometimes, uh, but I believe the code says a ministry. Is this because not all religious facilities are considered churches? You know, you might have a mosque or what have you. I'm just trying to understand. Um, well, when you say a ministry, because there are a lot I, of ministries have worked, out there, and I don't know. I have worked with Wiccans before, and they told me they were a ministry. So that's been a long time ago, but um, they are still alive and well, well in this state. And there are some other worshipers of other things out there. Uh, you know, there's no definition, really, of what religion is, too. So people can start a lot of different things out there. So... Um, on the ARPA funds that were distributed in 23, the child care stabilization grants, which went to the providers of child care centers, you can see was $220,897,125. So we put a lot of money out in um, 23. Then you probably read that we did the um, bonuses for the employees of providers. And in that, in 23, that totaled up to be $109,011,000. So we were trying to keep child care propped up as best we could to put that money out there and hopefully keep the, keep the doors open of the child care centers. And I do think it made a big difference, and most providers have told me that too, that they couldn't have stayed open without it. We also have what is called Alabama Quality Stars. We call, also call it QRIS. Um, and it's part of a systemic approach to um, improving the quality of child care in the state. And uh, we have a strong partnership with DECE that helps us actually work with centers to bring them up. Uh, we have five stars, starting with one star is the lowest, up to five stars. And then we give bonus money each year for ever how many stars you have. It's based on number of kids and what star level that you're at. So last year, the QRIS incentive bonuses were $21,163,850. Most of that um, for QRIS is funded through the ETF fund, and we're very grateful to have that because we do think it is making a difference in the quality of child care in the state of Alabama. The next program. Can I interrupt with a quick question on that? Um, I'm sorry, it's over here. Uh, can I interrupt with a quick question on that? Sure. Um, the federal opera funds for the stabilization, stabilization grants and the workforce bonuses, uh, is that the, the money uh, that was received in 23 um, from the ARP section 2202, that 414 million? Do you know if that's where that money came from? Is that like a one-time federal money? It, I, I will tell you, it came directly to DHR. Yeah, from so the fe did, federal. There was yeah. other money that came in the state that was right. distributed to other right. agencies. But, yes, that came directly to DHR. And is that anticipated for another year, or is that just no. a one and done? It, it, it's pretty much one and done. Yeah. We right. have just, I believe we've just finished um, our last stabilization bonus because we took – Whatever money we had left, that's why we couldn't say what the bonus is going to be. Right. We're going to see how many applicants we get, and we are going to get rid of all of that money because we don't plan to send any back. No, that's right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh-huh. Okay. On adult protective services, 
you will see in 23, we went out on 12,325 reports of adult abuse, neglect, or exploitation. We investigate those reports. Law enforcement generally works with us. Um, and if there's one bad enough that we work with the DA's office to help get the perpetrator prosecuted. Normally on those reports, the person, the perpetrator ends up being someone that the elderly or disabled person knows. Sometimes it's a relative, somebody, sometimes it's just a close friend or somebody that's gotten close over the years and has taken advantage of the elderly person. And then we get to child welfare. Um, not our largest program in terms of numbers like SNAP, but it is the program that takes up as much time as you can give it. Basically all the time, if you can give it that much time. Uh, we provide for the investigation and prevention of abuse, neglect, and or exploitation of children throughout Alabama. The first slide on page 13 just gives you a snapshot going back to 2014, how many reports come in over the year throughout the state in all 67 counties. You'll see in 23, the total number of children involved was 52,305 that um, we went out on and investigated. Again, sometimes uh, law enforcement goes out with us and we are grateful for that. Um, sometimes we go out by ourselves, uh, and then we contact law enforcement when we get out there and see what's going on. It just depends. On page 14, you see the source of our reports. I know sometimes some of the complaints that y'all get, it, uh, it appears that we're just looking for reports, but we don't look for them. People call us and actually report to us, and you'll see our greatest number that are being reported comes from law enforcement. The next number comes from education. Several years back, I believe education was a little bit higher than law enforcement, but then when COVID came, and I think it had to do with virtual school and that, and teachers weren't able to see children every day, the number of reports from education went down just a little bit, and they're still down a little bit. Uh, and then social service personnel and medical personnel reporting. I'm not going to go over all of those, but I thought it was kind of interesting to see what percentage of reports of all of those, where they came from. Then you'll see children in CPS cases. When DHR goes out on a report, sometimes there may end up being nothing to it. We have certain protocols we have to follow to actually not indicate a report or indicate a report. It, sometimes it will be not indicated, but there's still concerns there. And if there's concerns or something we can help the family with, we open the case up for CPS services. And that's where you see last year, 7,453 children were involved in those type cases. Sometimes there's no way to make the child safe and they come into foster care. And page 16 shows you our foster care numbers going back to 2018. Um, and you'll see currently we have around 5,906. That number changes every day. Children come in, children go out for whatever reasons. Ms. 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 Buckner, would yes. you, uh, I know you have these acronyms CPS and CANs, could you just kind of tell us what that acronym stands a, for? A CAN is a report of child abuse, neglect, and or exploit, exploitation. CPS is a child protective service case that's where we probably got a can or a report on, on someone and it did not rise to the level, maybe uh, the child needing to leave the home or go live with somebody else. So we opened the case up to help the family, basically. Um, and then some of the CPS cases are where children have been in foster care and the judge has sent them home but he'd really like for DHR to stay involved for 90 days or six months under court-ordered supervision. And those are also CPS cases, Child Protective Service cases. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, do yes. you have a number of the kids that are in foster care that aged out or was adopted, I think it was after age 14, that, were able, that is taking advantage of the education? 
um, bill that was passed several years ago. The Foster College and Hope Scholarship. College. Yep. I don't have it with me, but I can certainly get it for you. Okay. I can. At one time, we had several. I didn't know if that trend was continuing. We still have several okay. in, in there, and I can, a little bit later on, I have the number of how many graduated from high school and how many are in college and how many are in trade school okay. and that, but I don't have the exact number on Fostering Hope. But that was a wonderful thing that this body did several years ago for foster children. Okay, on page 17, just shows you the makeup of children in foster care. A lot of people are curious about that. You'll see that first block is gender. It's about half and half, half male, half female. The next block is race. 62% are white, 36% are black. Um, and then I didn't put it on here, but about 6% or a little over 6% of our children are, are, are Latino. And I compared that to what I could find on the state average. It looks like children, I think it was either 18 and under or 17 and under in Alabama, the, it was about 8.5% Latino children. So the number we have in foster care of Latino children is actually less percentage than the number we have as general population. And I thought that was interesting too. And then on the far right side, you will see the age groups. You can see birth to three, 27.68%. And you will see that 14 to 17 number is, is the next highest number. And that is 21.86%. And then 18 and over, we're a state that takes foster care to age 21. And that is 8.8%. Um, and you may wonder where we put all these children. <laughs> and you look at, and you see the, our foster homes, and that's 107, what we call provisional. Sometimes when we pick a child up and put them in foster care, we would really like to maybe keep them in school, close by, keep them close to their neighborhood or whatever, not to be disru as disruptive as we might could be. And, we have several times we've made teachers who knew the child's situation become what we call provisional foster parents. If you've known the child and you've lived in Alabama all your life and you have a relationship with the child, sometimes we can do that and, and give that child that continuity of being with people they know because that helps them do so much better than having to go into homes with people they don't know, especially if they're a teenager, it's kind of hard to adjust. Um, not to say that we are not thankful for all our foster homes, we are, but we're really thankful to those people that step up to the plate when that child's in need too. Related traditional homes, there's 111. Therapeutic homes, there's 519. And 2,376 traditional for a total of 3,113. Now we also have slots in what we call con congregate care. And we have just a little over a thousand slots in congregate care. We're always looking for foster parents because people sometimes they adopt children and they close their home because they've got their family or they may have fostered for 25 years and they're, they're tired or they're wanting to travel or something like that or they have an elderly parent they have to take care of. So we are always looking for foster homes. And can you give us a little information about therapeutic homes? What yes, those are usually done under contracts. Uh, they add more to the service. They're for children that have certain diagnoses. Um, they're uh, sometimes a step down from what we call intensive children. We step them down to therapeutic because they have components in, this, in that system. The contractor does like social workers that go out if the foster parent's having trouble, uh, there may be medication monitoring going on in that home. It's just a higher level of care than a traditional foster home is. So it's more related to medical or, or medical and or mental? Most of it's mental health. Mm -hmm. Sometimes medical we can put in a traditional foster home and pay an extra, we call it a medically fragile rate. We give them mm -hmm. some extra money and then they have to go get training maybe at the hospital the child came out of or whatever like that. Ms. Bogner, yeah. may I sure. go back one slide to 17? 
One thing that's disturbing to me on that is the zero to zero three, three year old. Uh, I understand the, the 14 to seven peak, you know, teenage years or teenage years. But I don't understand how infants and toddlers can become, uh, why is that such a high percentage? I mean, that's the highest percentage. And looking at your numbers, you're talking about 1,850 children uh, or so. It's a rough uh, estimate there. Uh, th that's that's in need of care. That's that's huge. Why why is this a, uh, so such an anomaly for that age group? Well, a lot of it has to do with the drug problem in Alabama. And if you get a baby born that's positive for opiates, mom's positive for opiates, or positive for several different drugs. Um, it's very concerning to the medical personnel, or if you've got a baby born with um, mom doesn't want anything to do with the baby. You know, they're, they're, they're uncomfortable about sending that baby home with mom, and maybe nobody's been to see her. And I think oftentimes, and I haven't run the numbers, but we probably get more reports because people are more astutely aware of somebody beating up a two-year-old than they are of somebody hitting that 14-year-old in Walmart. I mean, it just touches their heart, and that child's very vulnerable. I've got one right now. Um, actually, the doctors are waiting for him to die. He was beat so badly and suffocated, too. Oh, I'm aware that that and, happens. And I've been involved with these cases. I, I understand, you know, the, the, uh, what I don't understand is the number, the, the huge number of, yeah, I, of, do, of I think it has more to do with, um, and of course, that's three years. Four to six is two years. Seven to ten is three also. But I think it has more, people are more aware of those, of those younger children. And they're going in to see medical personnel usually more. Uh, than older children are too. So they see them and, you know, sometimes you remove the liability from the clinic over here and you give it to DHR to look at and um, on okay. the advice of their attorneys usually. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as far as reimbursement for foster parents, have we seen an increase in the pay since, since the inflation has came in? I am so glad you asked that question. No, sir, we have not. Okay. Is that up to us, up to the federal government, or up to you? Or where? Well, I need the I'm, money I'm to I'm sure do you need it. the money from us. I can certainly do it if I've got the money and to So do my that. question is how they survive, and if, I mean, I know my child costs me more money, so, uh, okay, that's something we need it's to talk about, I would think. It's something that needs to be done. I think so. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? It may be a little bit off the subject, but you raised an interesting conversation with the zero to three, and I'm just wondering, well, let's go to zero to six. Uh, as far as working with these parents who um, drug problems, uh, physical abuse with the children, do we d look at, is there any kind of working relationship or connection with these kids who obviously are, are going to be abused, uh, and as far as adoption of parents who want to have children but can't? We do when the case gets to that point, but you know, in this country, a yeah, parent has a right to their child, except under certain circumstances. So it takes a while to get there. But yes, we we we've been pushing permanency a long time, and our permanency numbers have have gotten much better in the state because we need to put the services in there more quickly, and we're putting them in there a lot quicker than we used to. And we've got to keep the doors of the court open for us to get in and out of court quickly to make that happen, too. And then our case has to hold up when it's appealed. Right. You know, I mean, we get this, and, and every time you come before us, it's, it's a learning experience for me. And because all of us, as we go back to our districts, I'm sure that we get these calls from our constituents or somebody representing constituents or even a family member. We, we, uh, you know, we are not immune to this either. So this information is good and, and we are learning as well. But the general public doesn't have this information. Many of them don't see this. And so when we start talking about we need more money, we need more resources, we need more help, and there may be families out there that may be considering being foster parents. But they just, you know, we just need to try to, 
I'd like to talk with you about doing whatever I can to try to help get the word well, out. Well, I appreciate I really it. And when I get on a little further, there's something else I'd love to talk to you about too outside this meeting. But speaking of Birmingham, we have had two wonderful groups of foster parent training going on over there. We finished one group and we've got already started another one. So that they are responding. Okay, great. Okay, um, I believe we've talked about foster homes on page 18. This is, page 19 is a very interesting page. And that's a bar graph showing you maybe what brings children into care. And you will notice on the birth, birth to three or birth up through six, you'll notice the green. And the green has to do with parental drug abuse. And it's not just drug abuse, but when you peel the layers back, there's drug abuse there. It's your ability to keep the child safe, your ability to parent the child. We have several times the under three is running out the door onto a busy street because mama is on drugs and she's taking naps basically all day long. Well, we pick the child up because the child's not safe because it's running into the street motorist called us almost hit the baby so but when you peel those layers back you see that drug abuse is the underlying issue there or we had uh, one lady that um, she liked to go clubbing so on friday night she would lock the children in the house it was an old house and she went clubbing when she came home hopefully the children were all right i think the oldest one in the group was seven it was three or four children. And, you know, what's the danger in that? Well, look at all those other things in the house. Or if the house burned down, the kids couldn't get out because everything was locked up. So, and then when you see what her real issue was, she was positive for meth. Meth is our number one drug that we, fi we still find in child welfare. There's some, there's some opiates too, but meth is the number one drug that we see all the time in Alabama. Um, so, like I say, we say drug abuse, but it's really the inability to keep that child safe. Um, but the interesting thing is that blue part. And you will see that is relinquishment. And it is really causing us problems in the child welfare program. Um, in my opinion, the foster care system was never set up to take part of the relinquishments that we're getting this day and time. Um, a lot of them have mental health issues. If we could figure out the resource out there to serve those children in their homes, which we are hoping to develop, then that would take care of some of the relinquishments. But then we have the relinquishments of youth that have committed crimes. Not that long ago, we ended up having custody of two. Both of them had been arrested for attempted murder. One of them had shot into an occupied building. The other one had shot a man in the stomach. Didn't kill him, but he shot him. He got his target. Those, children, those kids should not be in the foster care system. But that's what's happening in too often. And if you look at that, and I, I've been saying that, but I didn't really realize how it looked until we put it on this bar graph. And while it's not half of our cases, it's not the majority of our cases. It takes up all our time when we have those kind of kids because we have nobody to take them. I'm losing staff because of it, because our staff is having to stay with them and watch them. Our staff, again, has been beat up from them. We've had fires set in the building from them. Some of them may not have actually shot somebody or attempted murder, but they may have stolen the car, mom and daddy scared of them, or mom scared of them, can't come back to her house. So court gives them to DHR. Most, many times, I'm not gonna say all the time, some judges don't do it, but too many judges are doing that now. And it's like, we're what's left. Put them over here, DHR will take them. Had a judge ask the other day, where's, where's the room in the DHR building where y'all keep children? That's not a placement for a child. It's not a placement for a child, for one of our workers to have to take shifts. I mean, we do, we're taking shifts in some locations when we get these kind of children. 
they need to be going somewhere else and they need to be in the criminal system some, somehow and it might help solve part of our crime problem when they get older uh, if somebody was working with them because we don't have lockdown facilities. We can't have lockdown facilities. The feds won't let us do that. These kids need some kind of program to rehabilitate them from their criminal behavior. One, one child cleaned out grandmama's bank account, took all of her. What do they do with her? She's a foster child now. So we get them pretty regularly, some more in lo certain locations. Ms. Bugner, if, pursue that a little bit. You're, you're talking still about the blue, the relinquishment matter, right? Yes. And you, you mentioned two issues, mental health and criminal activity. Yes. Uh, I'm assuming the criminal activity is more uh, to the older set, the 14 and up, yes. more than the other. Uh, and your department, does it have or does it deal with mental health issues? We do deal with some mental health issues. I've noticed that that's not a, a criteria listed on any of your charts here that I've seen so far. Uh, where does that fall into the makeup? Or well, the relinquishments mental, is mental health issues and criminal activities that the parents can't keep them anymore because of the mental health issue. So the relinquishment blue is the one that, that indicates mental health issues you're dealing with and the criminal activities, mostly on the... Especially on the older kids. On the older kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you really can't expect foster parents to take kids like that. They won't. They're scared of them, too. I, I understand that, and I think your comment uh, uh, about the misconception of what the state has or doesn't have uh, among state employees is also um, dramatic there uh, as far as the expectations. Uh, I wanted to add something, I, and I think you're spot on, but I also believe that the environment, when you look at the green and those early years yes. in the environment that they've grown into has developed them into what the blue, they turn into, into the blue because of the lack of parroting that they had because of just neglect, pure neglect and the drug abuse. I don't know if those people have now transferred into the blue or not. Are these, when I see this first graph, are those staying in the same, are, are, could those, some of those be turning into the blue? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, you know, in, in 2000, I'm gonna draw a lot of comments for saying this, but in 2007, 2008, we had a very reputable group that came into Alabama. At that point in time, we were locking up what was called status offenders. And I say we, DHR was not part of that, but we as a state. Status offenders are offenses that if you were an adult, you would not need be locked up for. I totally agree with what the state did because we should not have been sending those kids to lock up for cursing the teachers, bidding on somebody you should, you, you know, it wouldn't happen as an adult. But I think over the years, we have overcompensated on locking some of those children up and rehabilitating them in programs because some of them could be rehabilitated. They just need the right program. And DHR doesn't have it. We've never, we run a foster care system. You know, we don't run a program for kids that have um, stolen cars, that have um, stolen cars and taken them to Florida, uh, stolen their, all their grandmother's money, um, pulled a knife on their dad. Um, we're just not equipped to do that. And to tell you the truth, it's, uh, it's not only challenging, it's, it's uh, causing us a lot of problems in certain locations. And I would like to agree what you're saying. Unless you know someone that's an employee there or something, you're putting our employees in a very, very dangerous position. They really are. I mean, very they dangerous. They really are. I, um, I got a text not too long ago from a young lady and I thought, she's a social worker in a county, why is she texting me in the middle of the night like this? And it was a young lady that had gotten 
bit. I, I talked about it last year. She, I didn't know that at the time because I didn't know her name, but she was having trauma all over because she was staying that night with that same kid that had bit her and sent her to the ER like a year ago or a year and a half ago. And she just sort of fell apart that night. Um, so yes, it's causing trauma, but it's causing us to lose employees too. Um, and it's causing uh, too much time. My management team, we spend time on it every single week. Where, where are we gonna put this young man? What are we going to do? Because we're trying to reduce our liability. And when we could be working with moms that need to kick their drug problem and mom, you know, for the zero to three year olds and that kind of thing, it's, it's taking time away from all those other cases <clears throat> that the child welfare program was set up to take care of. So, Mr. Chairman, can I ask you a question? Do, uh, is there, and, and maybe it's a kind of a three-legged stool here, uh, is there any, because right now there's no place to put these children. Obviously, DHR is not, you all are getting them by default, but you don't have, you know, everybody just looks at DHR as being the silver bullet for everybody, but that's not the case. Well, there's a lot, lots of juvenile law in the code. You're right, and so I'm wondering where does DYS figure, fit into this? Are they getting, I know our numbers are down at, at DYS, and I'm just wondering if there's, there's an option or is there a working relationship that you all have, how does that go? What, I mean, years ago I discovered yes, that our departments don't talk to each other, and it's kind of like, okay, you got him, it's under your budget, you take care of him, you know, it's that kind of thing. We've gotten a little bit better, but we're not there yet. Senator, it may sound like we need to have another agency or department here to discuss that. Maybe we ought to put them on the list sometime. Right, but I'm just I'm just saying that, and, and, I, and I don't mean to prolong the time, Mr. Chairman, but we, we have a situation here now that we've identified that, and I'm just wondering if there's this calls for maybe another subcommittee or something on how these agency can be, agencies can better work together to address what is obviously a gap in the system and really creating a pipeline to the agency that we just heard from yesterday, which is the uh, corrections facility, because that's what's gonna happen with the older kids. DYS can't get the kids, though, if a judge doesn't send them to them, and the judge doesn't get them if the JPOs don't open the case up. And you make an excellent point. Maybe Senator. we need to be having the judges to come in and talk to us. You know, they, they, I, don't, I just don't think everybody <clears throat> we don't have the full, full picture. I don't know everything, but I'm just saying some of this stuff that we are hearing, everybody that's involved with that child's life or any child that would come to them need to understand that there's a continuum, there's a connection here, and the end results are where we find the problems that we're having as the agency that came before us yesterday, which is corrections, is the end result. We, we cannot pay our money out of, I mean, our way out of this. Uh, but more importantly, we are losing all the human resources and talents of our state that we are not rehabilitating and we are not catching it at an early age to do something. It's not in an intervention that, that I see here. I agree. And giving them to DHR is not the answer I think for, that for a certain type child. I think you're exactly right with DYS, and I think that no one's going to step up and volunteer to do it because there's funding that would have to come along with it. And if they volunteer and do it without the funding, then we've got to make sure that we appropriate the correct amount of money for the correct area that needs it to prevent the pressure from coming on you so you can do your job. And that's where we're sitting today. It's amazing this conversation has been in our office for the last two days of a of a, the the area that is really needs the most help and can make the most impact on several reasons one they can deal with the kids they're prepared they're trained for it they don't have the facility or the personnel to do it but yet what they're doing is they're ending up here and then putting the pressure on them so it is a serious problem because this is a representative we've been Discuss well, we were talking about this yesterday, and yes. I think this is the biggest problem. You know, we, we keep talking about we're under the federal mandate to build the prisons, and we're spending these billions of dollars on prisons. Um, that's trying to address the leak in the down, down, downstream. Uh, we're not going upstream enough to look at what's going on to help these individuals get rehabilitated, whatever it is, a collective group. Uh, we kind of 
no pun intended, we're seeing this in education too. We push them through the system because so many dollars are tied to headcounts and average daily attendance and other things. We're not giving them the chance they need to have an opportunity because we can't legislate parental involvement in kids' lives a lot of time. You see that with a lot of the stuff that you're involved with in your department and others. So I do think it's a bigger conversation, broader conversation that we need to dig into because continuing to build mega prisons is not the answer to our problems. So we got to figure out what we do for them. I and mean, we had like a two hour conversation about this yesterday. So what do we do? And it starts with youth services and how that ties into your departments. But well, there really are some parents that are begging for help and they're going to juvenile court sometimes. You're, it's a systematic problem. And they're problem. not getting the help that they need. We're putting the pressure on three different, actually now three, counting you. You, our local hospitals are taking it the low, for the mental part. And yes, our local when jail, their days are up, that's, you that's just that's ask my up. staff how many calls we're getting a day from that's the right. hospital they're to move to them the, out. They're going, we're, we're having hospitals shut down because people can't pay. And we've got pressure on hospitals. We've got pressure on our county jails that are taking these folks in. Once they get out of your system, then they're just going to the next step, and that's where the pressure is. So what he's talking about is trying to go upstream, see what we can do to prevent that pressure in those three different areas. I agree completely. Okay. On page 20 are entries and exits from CARE. And you'll see it's real interesting that, you know, say 3,000 to 3,500 a year come into care and about the same number come out of care. So when I say we have approximately 5,900 children in care, doesn't mean that we didn't get 3,000 or so in, we discharged 3,000 or so. You have to keep it moving. If you don't, you will have this huge warehouse full of children and you sure can't afford to pay for all of them. So permanency is important after we have made them safe. Um, and you'll see that, that line going through that graph shows the number of months, those ch the average number of months those children were in care. In 23, the average number of months was 18.99% in care. And then the next page has to do with discharges too, but you can see what, what we discharge these children to. And you see where the green bars stop over right before halfway through. All of those are family. And while we're very proud of the number of adoptions we do, we are just as proud or maybe even more proud of those children going back to family. So we stay around 70% of our children going back to family, but you can see who those family members are. Um, and then the first bar has to do with adoption. And you'll see on adult custodial care, that line, again, has to do with how many months in care. That was 86.04 months. And most of the time when we get, we have uh, a discharge for adult custodial care, they've generally been in our care a long time. The next page has to do with um, discharges also. And up in the left-hand corner, the top, is the, and this is median, not average, length of time in care, that's what LOC is. The national average is 17.5 months. If you look at the bottom of that column, you'll see that the length of time in care for Alabama, the median, is 13.1 months. We are extremely proud of that, and how we did that in lieu of a 61% staff turnover and all of that, is absolutely phenomenal because moving, when you think about how many's coming in care, how many's going out every time, and you're able to make that go down, it's like moving an iceberg really for a state. And so our staff have worked extremely hard to get to that number, and we hope we work even harder to get to it, move it on down. The next slide has to do with high school graduates from foster care. And you'll see last year we had 199 that graduated from high school. You can see in 2015 we had 115. So we're having more of our foster children graduate from high school. And then, um, Representative, there's those current numbers uh, of how many are enrolled in college right now. That's 99 and 117 are enrolled in trade programs at this point. <coughs> Our greatest challenge, 61% turnover rate last year in child welfare. 
We're hoping it's not going to be like that this year. We've been working on several things, but that's one of our greatest challenges, as is placements, particularly children and youth with mental health needs and juvenile delinquency issues. Then we have lawsuits, social media, and outdated computer systems. But I'm happy to tell you today that that SNAP and TANF computer system, which is a phenomenal, really large project, is over halfway completed. Matter of fact, I think we start piloting in fall or January. Testing, excuse me. I want to pilot, but we're testing first before we pilot. But anyway, it's coming up, and so that, that has been uh, quite a challenge for us, but we're happy to say that. The child care system is almost finished, too. Heard somebody talking about um, the dashboards the other day, and they are wonderful. We are uh, using them in child care, and we're using them in resource management, too, with our providers. So the next one it has to do with staff turnover rate. The top line is child welfare. The other line is total DHR staff. And the line to the far right is what we're estimating. And um, I hope our estimates are right. Daniel has estimated these. And uh, I didn't disagree with him. I just said, OK, it's on you. <laughs> so anyway, seriously, we've done a lot of things. We've done some bonuses. Um, I mentioned to y'all last year, you know, we lease some cars out there for child welfare workers to drive when they're going out in the field or if they're having to pick up children and things like that. We're always looking for things to lift morale. Uh, the bonuses went, went a long way. They did. And um, so I know it kept some people from retiring because they sent me emails and told me it did. So we're uh, trying to hang on to what we've got and trying to recruit some more to come in. So, but it is a tough job. Next slide, page 26, you can see our staffing levels by fiscal year. And um, you can see what they were in 23. And you can see what they were in 2007, 4509. And in 23, they were 3709. Currently, we're at 3815. We look at it every two weeks. So uh, challenges to hiring and retention is page 27. One is competing with wages from other places, um, particularly in lieu of how much they can get paid and where their location for work is. Uh, most people want to work from home this day and time, but you can't really work at DHR and work from home. It just doesn't work. We did a little bit of that with certain sex when we were in the um, midst of COVID. Our numbers went down, and to get all this federal money we get, you do have to keep levels up. We're audited on everything. Um, so in child welfare, the biggest drawback is the, just the job itself, having to go out in the field, having to go in other people's houses, uh, having to go out all hours of the night sometimes. Um, it's just not the job that a lot of people want. And then those that may want it, their family doesn't want them to have it either because they're scared for them. And I, I certainly understand that. But handling emergencies, handling threats, getting bit, getting beat up, it's uh, not the job of preference this day and time. And then lack of placements for certain youth and having to work shifts, staying with that youth through the night is uh, very troublesome. They often encounter dangerous and traumatic situations. Many other entities are competing for the same staff with more pay and predictable work, work environment. Social media is again, they get threats on social media. People ride by their house. They're scared. They're scared for their children. Um, and then lawsuits. Lawsuits doesn't help, help us keep staff either. And our staff also get sued too, as well as me, pretty regularly. Um, so that's the drawbacks for working at DHR, even though personally, it's a, I think it can be one of the most rewarding jobs anybody can have. Um, they actually save lives. And um, that's really about the only way you can sell it this day and time. You've got to get somebody that likes to do that type of work and likes to help people and is not scared of everything else that's out there. State general fund appropriations, we certainly appreciate 
what you've given us uh, in recent years. Um, it has gone a long way. I put that graph in there and uh, thank y'all so much. As I said, we have got to develop. Before, before we move further mm -hmm. from that, I appreciate you putting this in. I'd like to dwell on this for just a few minutes, if we may, um, because you're correct. We, our funding for th this department, as with all departments, has increased, and in your situation has increased substantially. Um, you've also got and have received over the past few years a lot extra of, um, federal money, COVID money and other matters. Um, my concern is when the federal money dries up, gets spent, where do you go from there? I don't know that you're going to have, according to what we've had so far today, there's no indication that there's going to be a lessening of demand and certainly not a lessening of expenditures. How do we make that difference up? Uh, I'm assuming there will be a huge difference when the feds stop sending money in. Is, uh, am I correct there? Are you concerned with that? Well, of course I'm concerned with it. I'm concerned for the people. Like on the child care side, I'm concerned for the providers because child care is down. Like I said, we, and we need more child care. Y'all have heard all the workforce people say all that. We actually need more child care in certain areas, not necessarily across the state. There's still a lot of vacancies across the state. Most of, uh, it was almost a billion dollars that came in in child care money. We did some extra things that we had to stop doing when uh, part of that money has already ended, the other ends uh, end of September. My concern is for the child care providers, not necessarily for my department on that child care money. Um, we didn't use much federal money to fund QRIS in the child care arena. I hope that federal money continues. Like I said, that's pretty much from ETF because it has improved the quality of child care in the state, and I think it will continue to do that. But it's got to be funded. Um, on the, the SNAP federal money that came in, that's already ended. That was, um, that was extra benefits to people uh, that were receiving SNAP and extra ways that we had to calculate things, which ultimately resulted in them getting extra funds. So their, their level of money to spend on food has gone down. It has gone down already. Um, so just as far as the runnings of the department as a whole, we got a little bit of extra in child welfare, but not a lot, not like food assistance and, um, and child care. Those were the biggies that we got out of that. You know, the federal lawsuit, the class action, is troublesome for me. I've already spent a lot of money on that uh, in attorney's fees. There's more to come. Of course, we have some other lawsuits out there. Um, we had that other one that we were in with education, and that was six. But most of those have, um, I think, are gonna, we're going to be okay and won't have to spend a lot of money. Um, but the federal class action one is troublesome. Of course, I wasn't paying for it with federal money anyway. I have to take from somewhere else to, to, to pay for that. The troublesome part is what all we're going to have to do to stay afloat uh, on the child welfare side as far as developing services for these children that are in psychiatric residential treatment facilities. We've developed some uh, y'all get with the extra money that y'all have given us. Part of our problem is not just the money but it's finding the people out there to do it. Sometimes we'll put out an RFP and we get no response for the type of children that we're looking for placements for. And it's just very, very, very difficult to find these days. So, so the resources, whether in money or in personnel, are difficult. Or what? Money and or personnel, the trained personnel to do the services, are restricted. You can't find it. We, we're, every now and then we find one. So I, I'm not going to stop putting them out there because you, you never know who you might get lucky this time and find one. So we continue to put them out there. We continue to recruit the personnel. But in all honesty, child welfare in probably the most demanding child welfare county in the state, um, 
my folks have been running it for almost a year now because we couldn't get enough child welfare in there. We've been pulling from other counties. We've been practically running um, the child welfare in a county near you. Uh, can't even really find a person qualified to be a county director down there. Um, we've pulled in other counties to come and complete food assistance applications or CAN reports there. So we have two counties and I'm not, I'm not wealthy with staff at the state office either, but they've been real troopers. Like I say, we've got some that have been in one county for almost a year now working, trying to keep it all going. The other issue that I want to point out on, on the graphs and such that you have is we have the resources that's going up as far as money is what we're trying to provide, both federal and state. And yet the reports that we're getting uh, with the numbers of, of um, tragedies and matters that continue in our society that's going on is continuing to happen. I mean, the report that you're giving us today is very, very similar to what we've had five years ago or whatever. We, is there any progress that we're making um, in, in our society? Are we continuing to degrade? Is there, uh, is, or is there something different we need to do? Now, we've already discussed three or four other agencies that need to be brought in and talked to about this, but all of that's going to require more resources. Um, and if I might chide ourselves here, you know, we've, we've been in the process of uh, cutting taxes. We've been in the means of refusing uh, revenue uh, bills. Uh, and we are faced with de more demands, but we are restricting the resources further. Um, I'm not sure I see that changing in the next couple of years. I do see, as we've already discussed yesterday and others, a reduction in federal monies. We do see potential economic problems on the near horizon, and yet the demands are not going away. So whatever we do is going to have to require some kind of uh, rearranging of money from somebody uh, or some other agency to, to do less or more. Uh, those are some, going to be some hard decisions that you're going to have to make and we're going to have to make together to find a path to serve our people. Um, this, the picture that you painted is not very um, encouraging that way. Uh, and I, and you're, you're substantiating much of what my fears are. What keeps me awake at night is where are we going to move these very limited pieces on this very restricted chessboard to try to serve where we are. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow-up. Um, certainly, I believe, if I recall, I think we gave a, a substantial uh, boost to your 25 budget uh, related to psychiatric and mental health care for high-risk foster kids. Yes. So certainly, I'm kind of spooked by the, the words today that we're not getting people the RF, responding to RFQs. Is there anything the legislature can do to to you know, bring those providers to the table and to support us in those areas? Well, I didn't say we're not getting any. I'm saying sometimes we put them out and we get no response to them every now and then we put one out and we do get some response because we have expanded some. We have developed enriched foster homes, which has the psychiatrist and the psychologist attached to do that. We just need a lot more than what we have out there going. And we needed that money and we need we need money to continue to do that. But um, in answer to something that Senator Albritton said, you know, I think it's, um, as someone who's worked in the state a long time and done a lot of different things, I think it's, I think it's important to decide what, what is your priorities? You know, what are they? And then are you, are you getting bang from the bucks where you're putting your money? Um, and that's important too that's out there. So and that's exactly why we're here today. I know. And and why we do these things. So but you asked me about that. um successes. Those hundred and ninety nine foster children that graduated from high school, that's that's a huge success. 
those 70% of those families that got their foster kids back, like I said, we are not warehousing foster care, foster kids. And I don't know if y'all have read about Texas and some of the other states, but it is a nightmare because they are running over in hotels with kids out in Texas. They've got a federal lawsuit. They've been in well over 10 years now. And I forgot how many hundreds of, how many millions of dollars they have spent on that so far. Knock on wood. Um, but we, we are not there. And it's just by the grace of God, I would say, that we're not. Um, but we have a good workforce, I think, even though we are looking for ways to incentivize it and hold on to it because we certainly need it. And the competition is greater for me with other agencies. It's great to have social workers everywhere, but you know what happens? They see that as an easier job than working in child welfare at DHR. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag that we create when we do good things over here you may be hurting something really bad over here. Uh, so that just all has to be taken into consideration. I do have one more slide, though, that... Uh, I didn't mean you know, to cut you off. I just wanted to take that opportunity, so... Appreciate it. Um, and you look at all that money that y'all did give us, and the last page is not does not include everything, but when you look at DHR by the numbers and what that agency does... We fed 776,000 Alabamians every month for the past year. We fed 718,000 children in school. Um, we give TANF benefits to 10,484, 2,372 jobs clients are working. What if we could put 2,000 in the workforce in Alabama right now? What would that do for the workforce? It would make a difference. Uh, child support cases, 182,325. If we hadn't collected that money, that's that many more people that would be on SNAP or some other public welfare benefit. 357 million in child support came in the state. You look how much we're in court, about 38,000 cases approximately in a year's time in 67 counties across Alabama in the state office. 41,000 children received, low-income working parents received subsidies for child care. If they didn't have that, they probably couldn't go to work. $262 million paid to support families in need of child care. $351 million to the providers to keep the doors open. Then we licensed and inspected, so we went out on more than 4,000 of those kind of visits. More than 12,000 elderly people uh, and vulnerable people were protected. 52,000 children in child abuse and neglect complaints. 59. 5,900 children are in foster care on a daily basis. Um, 7,453 are in their own homes. If we had to pick them up, look what that would do to our foster care numbers. It'd be huge. 2,000 foster homes are licensed and inspected. 47,327 central registry checks are done. We do that for churches and people that are having adults come in for Bible school to make sure they're not a child molester or something in our central registry. We also provided 26,195 criminal history checks that went through our office last year. Then um, we've got 4,500 SNAP clients that are in training. It'd be great if we could put them in the job force right away. 1,700 participants in fatherhood and 700 individuals received assistance for domestic violence last year. That doesn't include 3,000 children that we fund after school programs for, 1,100 that we're helping protect crossing state lines, and the list goes on and on. So, um, something to consider. Thank y'all very much. Any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them or get you Thank an answer. You. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all you that you do. Um, and yes, open up for any questions or comments, buddy. I just have one comment, and really, um, I, I'm, I'm impressed that the 117, and what was the other number, that, that are in uh, 199, that are in uh, some type of advanced education. I think about the families and the futures of those that are attached to those numbers, because, you know, uh, we, we find that in families where you have criminal activity or things that's going on in the families, like all of the, the people that are in foster care are associated with it. If that's all you know because that's what you grow up with, it's a, it's a repeat. It's a revolving door. This is the stopgap of the revolving door to say there is another alternative. 
so it's changing the lives of that particular family, their children that will come after them, and providing a role model to say that, hey, if I did it, you can do it. And I'm hoping that we'll, if, if, if these recipients of this education are, are in agreement, in agreement, that is something that we can, we talk about marketing and publicity, that this is something that we promote and hold out there because the child may not be in foster care, but there's another child that's looking up to say, hey, you know, I have problems, but there's somebody that overcame a whole lot bigger obstacle than I did. So, and this is a great example. You know, the numbers are not in the thousands, but if you look at the exponentially, the numbers that they could be potentially impacted by it. I think it's outstanding. I just want to thank you and your staff for all that you all do. We don't realize because we don't see it, but you all are really where the rubber meets the road. And all of these numbers that you have given us, if you all were not there, can we imagine how this would, I, I just can't imagine. <clears throat> we don't have enough social agencies and things like that to take in all of this. And certainly we don't have enough money here on, in the government side to do it. So thank you all for all that you do and what we don't know. Thank you. Most of what we do is confidential and people don't know and don't realize it. So I welcome the opportunity to tell people. Thank y'all. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your patience with us. All right. I saw the commissioner here earlier. Where's our DNCR? There you are. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you on this morning? Uh, well, better now that I see you here. <laughs> we don't have you here often, so I thought it was uh, uh, an excellent opportunity to get to hear about uh, all that you do. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you are correct. I do not have to to do this very often, so I hope you all take it easy on me since I uh, only have, to, have only done this a few times in my eight years as commissioner, but I do appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about the Department of Conservation and, and our staff and the work that they have going on, and uh, obviously glad to take any questions from you all as we, as we go along. I do want to introduce, uh, as you all uh, pass out the, the PowerPoint presentation so you all can have it, have it with you, uh, our Deputy Commissioner Ed Poulos is here. Our General Counsel Scar Charlana Skaggs is here, uh, Attorney Juliana Dean, and our Chief Financial Officer, uh, um, uh, Joseph Ossington, uh, is brought here. The, whole the, the money man, the money man. the whole battalion, didn't you? We, we brought a few. Uh, I did, uh, I figured if there's questions about uh, certain things that I can't answer, I figured I'd bring the right folks to, to be able to, to answer those. Um, So my, my goal this morning is to give a little bit of an overview about our department, just because um, not everybody truly understands or appreciates what all we do in the Department of Conservation. So as I start to talk through some things, I do like to always start with just a quick overview of our, of our people. Then I want to talk a lot about our parks projects. Uh, Y'all were very gracious at passing an $80 million bond a few years ago. We've been able to add a lot of money to that from other sources, and we've got a, a lot of work going on in our state parks, so I want to share that progress with you. And then talk about a few other things in the department, and then our Deepwater Horizon oil spill work that we have going on the coast uh, that I think is, is important. Uh, so, our, so our department is made up of four main divisions. Uh, we have our state parks division, which you're familiar with, the 21 state parks. We have our wildlife freshwater fisheries division, which uh, we have all the hunting and uh, freshwater fishing uh, regulations and, and work that we do around the state. That includes 46 uh, wildlife management areas, 23 state lakes, uh, 13 shooting ranges, 21 archery parks. Uh, about 750,000 acres of public hunting land that we manage throughout the state. Our Marine Resources Division down the coast where we manage all the saltwater commercial and recreational fishing, all the oyster and crab and shrimp and gillnet fishing, red snapper, uh, seafood dealers uh, around the state. We manage uh, all of those. And then our State Lands Division where we have the Forever Wild Program. Uh, we manage state properties. Uh, we manage the 16th section lands for um, uh, in, income for the edu departments of education around the state. Um, you know, for instance, on that, just recently uh, we bid a coal lease uh, and that will benefit uh, Choctaw and Washington County's school systems about $12 million over the next 10 years in coal revenue that comes off of some 16th section land that we manage for them. 
The feds allowed us to do that. <laughs> they did. They do. Uh, and then our Deepwater Horizon oil spill section, uh, where we're managing all of the funding sources from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, And just a brief overview about the department. You know, the budget that was passed last year that begins October 1st uh, was about $435 million for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Of that $435 million, $165 million of that is uh, Deepwater Horizon funds. Then a lot of that is passed through or projects that we're managing. Uh, and then the GOMESA, Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, about $76 million in the budget that starts in October. Uh, so that just kind of gives you a... Uh, uh, th those are large numbers that make up a, a, our budget. But just in, in reference, in 2017, my first year as commissioner uh, here, our budget was $142 million. So that's been quite a, a change, most of that coming through Deepwater Horizon funding and Go Mesa. But then we've also had an increase in revenue from our state parks and from our wildlife freshwater fisheries division uh, and through license sales and other work that, that they do. We have about 1,280 employees as of uh, August 1st in the Department of Conservation. So it's a fairly, fairly large department uh, overall. Uh, I'm going to run through a, these state park projects. I, um, these are, this is in no way uh, comprehensive of all the work we have going on. Just to be totally honest with you, it's what I could fit on a slide. I didn't, uh, I put enough on each slide to make it where uh, it was still big enough that I thought y'all could read it. If I put everything on there that's going on, I think it'd be so small none of us could read it. So I, I picked the highlights. Just enough to make the rest of us jealous. <laughs> so uh, I'll run through these. Feel free to stop me at any time if you have a question about a, a specific park or project that's in your, uh, in your district that you want to know about. Glad to talk about that. But these are the state park projects, construction projects that are, that are com completed, ones that we've gotten done. Uh, Oak Mountain State Park Campground, we cut that ribbon back in May. It's about a $12 million project, been very well received. At Joe Wheeler State Park, we've got new cart pass T to Green. Uh, we paved all of the roads at Joe Wheeler State Park, about seven miles of roads in cooperation and partnership with ADEM using uh, recycled uh, tires, uh, rubber modified asphalt. Uh, that was a, a really good joint project between two state agencies. We reno renovated uh, two thirds of the campground and the day use uh, area, new beach pavilion restrooms uh, there at the, at the day use area and the campground. Those were damaged in 2019 in a tornado that came across the Tennessee River into um, Joe Wheeler State Park. And um, so that, that, that was part of the reason for for that renovation of both of those areas. We've, uh, and then we've renovated the swimming pool at the lodge. At Gulf State Park, we have 20 new lakeside cabins on Lake Shelby. Those cabins were damaged in Hurricane Sally. Uh, there we had 17 cabins there. We had to uh, just bulldoze those down and start over. Uh, we did receive some money from risk management and put some more money with it to build the 20 new cabins. Uh, we renovated, renovated all 11 bathhouses at the, the campground there. The Romar Beach access, we've added a bathroom and additional parking. Uh, and then at the, the Lodge of Gulf State Park, we added a dragonfly bar and additional pool seating uh, to increase the capacity around the pool at the lodge. Um, at Chihai State Park, we renovated both the upper and lower campgrounds and the CCC cabins at Chiha over the last few years. In Montesano, uh, we did the, the uh, campground renovation at that state park. Uh, we have some other additional work going on there now, adding more ADA sites at Montesano uh, and some day use area improvements. At Lake Point State Park, all the cabins and cottages have been refreshed and the marina building updated. At Gunnersville, the chalets uh, were renovated a couple of years ago. Uh, and then the pool was renovated this, this past year. And again, all the roads at Gunnersville State Park were paved, uh, almost all the roads at Gunnersville State Park were paved with that rubber modified asphalt in that partnership with ADEM. Um, and then in Cathedral Cavern State Park, we built a new campground there using some ARC uh, grant funds along with some Department of Conservation funds and the cave entrance has been upgraded um, there at, um, at Cathedral Cavern State Park. And I will say uh, we have a small meeting room inside the cave at Cathedral Caverns. We hosted a meeting there with some folks uh, earlier this summer when it was about 95 degrees outside and it was a cool and comfortable 60 degrees inside the cave in that, in that little meeting room that has become somewhat of a popular attraction there in North, North Alabama. 
uh, current projects that are currently underway. We're rebuilding the Gulf State Park Pier where it was damaged in Hurricane Sally. It's about a $14 million uh, renovation on the pier. Most of that is paid for uh, with FEMA funds and then the natural resource damage assessment funds from the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, we hope to open that up really next Monday, open the pier back up, and then we'll have a ribbon cutting. I think it is the September the 13th for the official ribbon cutting. On that, we're uh, renovating the new we're renovating the beach pavilion at Gold State Park, all the bathrooms there, um, that whole, whole pavilion complex. And then the lodge at Gold State Park, uh, we're doing, starting some FF&E refurbishment on the hotel rooms this year. Um, just as a, a quick piece of information there, you know, the lodge opened in November of 2018. It has, it's it's uh, hard to believe that the hotel's been open that long there. One thing that uh, I learned in my time on the board at RSA was in the RSA properties, they set aside a little bit of money of, off of gross revenue from every room that they rent. They put in a fund so that when it's time to renovate the hotel rooms every five to seven years, they have some money available to do that. And so we use that model and we've done that at Gulf State Park at the lodge there so that we put a little bit of money back every time somebody rents a room into an account so that when it comes every, like now, five or six years uh, on the beach with all that sand and the, and the uh, environment down there, we need to do some work. We don't have to come back and ask for money for something. We have some money put back for that. So uh, appreciate our staff and, and uh, what they're doing down there at the Lodge of Gulf State Park. Lake Point State Park, uh, all the lodge rooms are under, under renovation. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Poulos and I went over to Lake Point last Wednesday to, to take a look at that project, and it's pretty extensive. Uh, those, those rooms are going to be really nice. And then we have new HVAC for all the, the conference center that's uh, going on. And that didn't, when I first uh, put that on this list, it didn't sound like that much work until we were over there the other day, and I saw 15 gigantic units sitting in the parking lot waiting on the crane to come to lift them up on top of the uh, facility. And I realized that, that HVAC uh, work was a lot more extensive than I thought it was. I thought we make sure to keep that on the list. At Gunnersville State Park, we have concrete cart paths going in, tee to green. Um, at Montesano, uh, the CCC cabins are all being renovated, uh, day use area upgrades, and adding some, like I said, some ADA sites to the RV park. Um, at DeSoto State Park, the new pool, we'll have a new pool house there. We're going to totally demolish the pool house that's there, uh, build that, build that back, new trails. And if anybody's been to the um, uh, DeSoto Falls day use area. Uh, we've done a lot of work up there and still have work continuing where we dredged out Little River. We've gone back in and added sand to make a sand beach there, uh, paved the parking lot, uh, added some new restroom facilities there, and we're, we're working on adding additional parking uh, in a piece of property that we acquired several years ago. At Wind Creek State Park uh, on Lake Martin, uh, we have these fabulous three bedroom, three bath cabins that are being built there that will fit very nicely into the market at uh, Lake Martin, along with renovating two loops of the campgrounds, it's about eleven and a half million dollar project between the two of those. And Mayor State Park on the Causeway, we're adding 45 campsites, um, a big old bathhouse that, to go with that, and adding six new cabins to go with the four cabins we had there to give us 10 cabins at Mayor. Those cabins were very popular and stayed, stayed full. And most of the work at Mayor State Park is, uh, some deep water, is a deep water horizon project uh, funded by the Alabama Restore Council. In Joe Wheeler State Park, State Park, we're renovating some of the lodge rooms and the windows and the restaurant, restaurant and some other work there. And then um, these are new projects that are going to begin in 2025. Most of the engineering and design work is done on these. Some of these have already been bid. Other ones will be bid in uh, late August, uh, probably early September now as they work through the final design, but they will begin in FY 2025. At Chiha Hotel in uh, Senator Price's district, um, we, we've had a, a good opportunity up there to look at the facility that we had, whether we needed to renovate that or if we needed to uh, make an other, other decisions on what to do up there. The facility was really in such bad shape, we decided just to bulldoze it off the side of the mountain at Chiha and build a brand new hotel uh, there using mass timber construction, working with some of our forestry uh, partners here in Alabama, uh, use wood sourced in Alabama for that, for that project. And so that has been bid. It's about a $25 million project, but it's going to be first class uh, and, and indicative of what we should have at the highest point in Alabama at uh, Chiha State Park. Um, at Gulf State Park, we had to close the golf course uh, several years ago just because it was uh, not doing well and needed a lot of, lot of work at the um, at Gulf State Park, we're going to take that golf course site and turn that into uh, an additional executive campground. 
We have 496 spots currently at Gulf State Park, and those spots stay full almost all year long with a huge waiting list. So to add additional revenue for the park, we're going to build a, a new section of the campground on the old golf course site. And we'll, uh, that's about, estimated to be about $23 million for that uh, new campground and the amenities over there, clubhouse and a few other things. We'll bid that, uh, like I said, in September. Uh, Lake Lurleen State Park, uh, close to Tuscaloosa, we're going to do a total rebuild of that park. It, uh, it was in need of everything. Uh, it had not been touched really in a long time, and uh, so we're going to renovate that entire park. Uh, we're going to bid that in September as well. We think that's going to be about a $15 million project there. At Rickwood Cavern State Park, um, we had a, a tree that fell in a storm a couple of weeks ago that fell through the pool house there at, uh, at Rickwood, so we're going to have to... We're, we, we were already looking to we were already looking to, to make improvements to that. Now we're going to have to make improvements to that once they got the tree out of the middle of it uh, and, and do that work there and uh, uh, a new playground and do a refresh. And then there was some there was some money that was included in our budget last year, uh, about one and a half million dollars for a new entrance road uh, at at Rickwood Cavern so that it will connect directly to I-65. Um, it's a very from where the park sits is very close to I-65, but to get to it, you had to get off at two exits and come way around uh, to get in there to it. This is a, a project doing it in partnership with Blunt County, where we'll be able to build, build the road that will connect directly at the interstate uh, interchange right there. Uh, we're doing the engineering and design work now out of our funds so that uh, in October 1st, when that money is available very shortly after October 1st, we'll be ready to bid that and do the, get the construction underway um, in the early part of FY25. Um, Chihuahua State Park uh, built a new um, meeting facility in, in the, the great lawn there. It's like a, like a barn dominium with roll-up doors with restroom facility that you know that you can be open air or you can shut those roll-up doors and have it as a, um, a facility to, to meet there. Um, then we have, you know, you see a few other things on the list. The Soda State Park Lodge Room renovations, that's uh, one of our projects that we're, we're uh, as we work through all of the bond funding and see what money is available, uh, how the bids come in on these other larger projects that I mentioned. The DeSoto Lodge Rooms, is a, um, we have that design done and we'll see if we have enough money available to be able to bid that this year or if we need to wait on that uh, to next year so we can, can make some more money or have more money available. And then we have 38 water and sewer upgrade projects in most of our parks in partnership with ADEM. Uh, we are uh, we've gotten most of the engineering and design done on those projects. We're ready to start construction. We're just waiting on uh, letters uh, from, from ADEM uh, authorizing us to move forward with those, with those projects. But that is a good partnership with uh, Director Lance LaFleur and our friends over at ADEM. We, we work real, real well together uh, as state agencies. And then just some quick other information. I think there was uh, that might be of interest to you uh, from the state parks. We, uh, August 1st, we opened up a 13-month booking window for Alabama residents. Previously, you can book a, a year out, 12 months. We added an additional month so that Alabama residents got first shot at, uh, at renting places. Where that's really particularly important is like down at Gulf. Like I said, we have 496 campsites. Those stay full almost year-round, giving Alabama residents an extra month to book those before out-of-state folks uh, I think would be helpful there. And then places like Cheha and DeSoto, uh, in Montesano, uh, in the fall, when the leaves change, you know, those are extremely popular, and those book a year out. Uh, this will give our, our residents an opportunity uh, to book there first. Uh, we, we just completed a beach renourishment project last winter in, in Gulf Shores Orange Beach and at Gulf State Park. It's a $33 million project. Not, uh, our por portion was a little bit over three, about $3.5 million of that to do the, the uh, uh, beach renourishment. But if you've been to the, the beach, this year down in Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, you know, the beach extends out several hundred feet further than it did uh, last year when you went down there through that uh, partnership we had with those two cities. Uh, we're involved in Wi-Fi upgrades at all of our parks. We have uh, run fiber to all of our parks, and now we're building out the Wi-Fi network within the parks. We've got most of them done now. We've got about half, a little bit less than half of them left to build out the Wi-Fi network within the parks. We're uh, working on EV charging partnerships in different parks with different in different locations. That's uh, kind of an up and coming thing that we really need for our parks is to have that EV uh, charging opportunities. Uh, we have a concessionaire that has uh, done some glamping sites at several of our parks and those were wildly popular. Uh, they stay, stay booked. Uh, it's been a good financial decision for us. Uh, they rent the campsites from us and then we get a percentage of gross revenue for those glamping sites and that has uh, 
uh, been more popular than I thought they would be. Uh, I would just assume stay in one of our cabins with the air conditioner and a bathroom and all the nice niceties of that as opposed to a, a really nice tent, but I'm, I'm in the minority. Those, peop those things stay booked uh, regularly, so I appreciate uh, our partnership there. Uh, dynamic pricing began about three months ago. Uh, I've been charged by uh, members of our state parks uh, oversight committee and others in the legislature to run our parks like a, like a business. And so a part of running that like a business was to include dynamic pricing. Uh, so with our new reservation system, we have that opportunity. So for instance, if there's a big bass tournament or um, one example is the, the boat races at Gunnersville every year uh, when they do the, the big boat races, the demand for our hotel rooms is, is through the roof. This will allow us to be able to charge market rate uh, for some of those events like that where, um, you know, where we're receiving the, the funding uh, commensurate with, with demand, just like every other hospitality venue uh, around, the, around the country. And then uh, just of interest, we're hosting the National uh, Parks Directors Conference in September. We'll have all the park directors from all over the country, and I'm excited to share with them all the good work we got going on in state parks, make them all jealous what we got, got going on down here in our partnerships that we have with, with the legislature and uh, our local communities and other things we have going. Any questions about park stuff before I move on to other things? So we manage about 150 boat ramps around the state. One of the initiatives of mine and, and Governor Ivey has really been to increase boating access. You know, we have more miles of navigable waterways in Alabama than any other state. Um, it's very important for us to be able to, for people to be able to get on the water and enjoy that. Uh, even though we manage 150 boat ramps, there were a lot of locations we identified that either didn't have adequate boating access or as communities have grown and the usage just has uh, increased in certain bodies of water, they needed either upgrades or additions to the boat ramps or renovations. So I won't go through this whole list. I won't read the whole list with you, but uh, you know, we did a great project in Demopolis, partnering with um, Marengo County and the city of Demopolis, about two and a half million dollars to do a tournament facility over there uh, in downtown Demopolis. I still get pictures from uh, the mayor and from the park and rec director uh, on a regular basis when they host a 250 or 300 boat tournament, they'll send me a, uh, an aerial photo or something of all the uh, boats that are, that are in the tournament, that are staying in hotels, that are getting gas and buying, uh, eating at the restaurants over there and thanking us for our, our participation and partnership with that. So that's a, that's a good feeling. Just completed a similar project in the city of Selma. Uh, you, you see the, the whole list. There's, there's a lot of work going on all over the state. I don't want to just stand here and brag all day long about all the boating access work we got going on, but I am very pleased with our staff and how, we're, how we are doing this from one end of the state to the other to try and get people on our waterways. Uh, and and uh, I see Representative Sales there. He knows what, how important it is to have you a good boat ramp uh, to launch and, uh, and a safe place to park your vehicle and uh, a place that you can count on. We have 23 public fishing lakes. Um, most of those lakes were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s um, all over the state. And uh, most of them look like they were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They, uh, they have uh, the dams at those lakes. A lot of them have, are, are very close to the end of their useful life. Um, the water control structures, the facilities there, the restrooms, you know, how the public accesses those. And most of those, when they were built, were really in rural communities out in the middle of uh, rural Alabama that provided subsistence fishing for their citizens and that's why they were built so that people in those communities could have um, protein that was provided in these state lakes. Well as our state has grown and, and uh, communities have moved closer and closer to these state lakes we've had a tremendous amount of other recreational opportunities where we've partnered with communities. Uh, Walker County is a great example. We have an archery park there, a hiking trail all around the lake along with um, uh, some other outdoor rec opportunities. Down in Pike County Lake in Troy, uh, same thing, we built an archery park there in, in partnership with the city of Troy. They got a walk and hiking trail, a boat ramp. They built a small meeting facility at the lake. Um, so that's just kind of an example of the things that we're seeing in different parts of the state. Um, in the budget that begins October 1st, y'all included six million dollars uh, from the general fund. Uh, for us to do some, some work at our state lakes. With that money, we'll be able to replace the dam at Marion County Lake, and then we'll turn that over, uh, management of that, to the city of Hamilton uh, to, to manage, and they want to do the same thing. Once we have the lake 
stabilized and filled. They want to do hiking trails and maybe some RV sites and some other recreational opportunities for their citizens at the state lakes. So that $6 million we're very appreciative for. Uh, that will help us do, do work in the five most critical uh, lakes uh, around the state. But I did put that in a different color because this is my only ask uh, of the, all that I have here for you today is that uh, I anticipate that you'll see a request from us to continue that in the 2026 budget for some additional funding for us to do work on the other state lakes uh, so we can try to bring them up to a, um, a good standard in, for those communities. We got uh, 13 shooting ranges. I left that, uh, it, it drove my secretary crazy to leave that crossed out uh, part on the slide, but I wanted you to, to see that, that it, it just shows we're really going from 12 to 13, and that's really a stepping stone to continue to have more shooting range opportunities throughout the state. Uh, we've purchased some property in Columbiana uh, for a, a really large shooting range uh, up there that will, that will have uh, 300-yard rifle range, 100-yard rifle range, pistol courses, uh, skeet uh, and trap shoot um, facility up there. Uh, we're developing a shooting sports trail all together. Most of the funding that comes through the department from the federal dollars that comes to wildlife and freshwater fisheries, a lot of that comes from an excise tax on uh, guns and ammunition on the federal level. Used to, hunters paid for most of the management of our resources in the state through uh, buying guns and ammunition. Now target shooting has overtaken hunting as the largest source of revenue that goes into that, we call Pittman-Robertson dollars on the federal level. Target shooting provides more money to that fund than uh, hunting now. So it's important for us, I think, to be able to cater to the people that are, buy, that are funding, uh, funding that. And, you know, uh, selfishly, I guess I'll say, if we provide more places for people to shoot recreationally, they'll buy more guns and they'll buy more ammunition, which brings in more money that comes into the department through that, uh, through that funding source. Uh, so we're being, trying to be good stewards of that. Um, and our next objective, you know, we'd, like to, we'd like to have an indoor range here in Montgomery. And so we're working to try and find a good location for that uh, in some of the facilities uh, in Montgomery, maybe some uh, existing buildings that we could get at a, a fair price and retrofit to make an indoor shooting range here. And then we have the largest artificial reef program in the country that's managed by our Marine Resources Division down the coast. Um, we've recently created seven new reef zones. We deployed about 1,000 new reefs over the last year, year and a half uh, offshore. We have more reefs planned for 2025. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Alabama Power Company where they're using some of their, as they upgrade their facilities with boilers or uh, some of their other machinery. Uh, we're, we're partnering with them to take that material offshore and make artificial reefs out of it instead of it going to a landfill or being scrapped. Uh, that's been a, a great partnership. Um, along with that partnership, we've, we've worked with like Cooper uh, Marine to provide a, a barge that was at the end of its useful life to transport that material offshore and sink all of that as a reef. We have a very similar project that will be reefed in September uh, in, in cooperation with Alabama Power. And uh, just kind of a little plug here at the bottom. Uh, as we've worked with the different companies uh, in the past that were going to do the work on the mobile, the new mobile uh, river bridge and, and bayway project, as they tear down the old bridge, our goal would be that we use most of that material to transport that offshore from the old bridge and make uh, artificial reef out of that. So uh, we're, our staff is working with the uh, Department of Transportation to try and see if we can include that in some of the construction project. And then I guess I want to give you a quick overview of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill work that we do. Um, that is probably some of the work that's done that we don't do as a very good job of uh, publicizing and talking about. Uh, that's my fault. You know, we're so busy doing the work that I don't do a good job, a very good job telling about it. But right now we have about 176 projects that we are managing in Mobile and Baldwin counties using. Uh, funding either from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, the Federal Restore Council, the Alabama Restore Council, or the Natural Resource Damage Assessment, NERDA, funds uh, that come to the state from, from DWH. All of those projects total a little over a billion dollars that are either completed, underway, or are come, or approved. Uh, a little over a billion dollars for managing down there in, in, in coastal Alabama. I know you say, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, that was in 2010. This is 2024. Why are we still uh, fooling with this? 
So this is just a little bit of a timeline, just to uh, refresh everybody's memory on, on what happened. You know, that uh, terrible tragedy was in April of 2010, where 11 people lost their lives, and it was, you know, very devastating uh, for us in the Gulf of Mexico and, and here in Alabama. Trustees reached an agreement. There was some money, some money made available for early restoration, but the, the biggest uh, part it kind of dropped down to the bottom. In April of 2016, the Department of Justice, all of the states, the federal agencies, and BP and Transocean reached an agreement on the settlement in April of 2016. In that settlement, BP is making deposits annually through 2031. So here it is, 2024. They started in 2017 was their first deposit. So we're about halfway through the deposits that are being made on the Deepwater Horizon projects. Um, the NERDA projects are a little bit ahead of that. Um, the National Fish and Wildlife NIFWF money, we've, we've pretty much allocated most of that. That was on a different time scale, but they're still making those deposits every year through 2031. I'm not going to talk to you about all 176 projects because I know that would bore you all to death and take all day long. But uh, this is our, uh, we have a website. If you just go to OutdoorAlabama.com, our main website, if you search Coastal Restoration, you'll see the map. It's got a map of uh, every, every project and a description of those things uh, going on. But um, these are the projects we currently have in construction that we're managing uh, in Coastal Alabama. Uh, Three Mile Creek Greenway, uh, dredging at Langham Park, some stormwater mapping in the city of Mobile, uh, Africa Town Welcome Center, uh, that is a, a construction project that has been bid and underway, Gulf Shores Ecotourism Campus, <clears throat> ALDOT Capacity Improvements, that were some projects that were done on Highway 31 in Spanish Fort, Highway 181 in Fairhope, and then uh, Canal Road down in Orange Beach were projects that were funded um, Two of those have been completed. One's almost completed. That's why it's still in the uh, under construction uh, part. But that was some of the funding for those projects were, were uh, provided through the uh, Department of Conservation and the Deepwater Horizon funds. Have three sewer projects going on in Fairhope. Uh, the Biolabatory Force Main Extension. I think that is an important project if you like oysters. Um, the oyster aquaculture industry is really growing in Alabama. Uh, we manage a lot of that through our department and through the Alabama Department of Public Health. But there's a uh, sewer outfall on Viola Battery. Uh, the area around that, the growing waters are closed because of the uh, affluent. We're extending that sewer outfall about four miles further offshore. Once we do that, um, uh, then all of that, those water bottoms around Coffee Island and Viola Battery and Code Inn will be available for oyster aquaculture uh, work. And so we really feel like companies will come in, invest some capital in that oyster aquaculture industry once we get that force main moved a little bit further offshore and improve water quality in upper Mississippi Sound. Um, just, just a lot of really, uh, really good projects. The last two, uh, Deer River Shoreline Protection and the Dolphin Island Causeway and Habitat Restoration, those are large-scale projects where we're, we're building um, living shorelines or breakwaters out from the shore, and then we're working with the Corps of Engineers as they're deepening and widening the ship channel. We're going to use the material from the channel pump it behind these breakwaters and build new land between that and, uh, uh, and the shoreline. So like on the Dolphin Island Causeway, if you've been down there recently, you probably saw all the rocks out there and then there's a bunch of water between those rocks and the land. Uh, that ain't, that's not going to be water between the rocks and the land very much longer. We'll be pumping material there from the ship channel to fill that in uh, to protect that causeway um, and, and build some new, some bayous and creeks in that to, to uh, add some new habitat for shrimp and uh, crabs and, and other, other species. So that's really a large-scale project, about $25 million. Some of that comes from Deepwater Horizon oil spill funding, and some is from a NIF, NIFWF resilience funding uh, that they, they were gracious enough to provide uh, to that project because they thought it was so important to protect the only road in and out from uh, Dolphin Island. Um, and these are some completed construction projects. Uh, you, you have the list there. I just hit a couple of high points. Um, um, we expanded the sewer in Orange Beach uh, to, to the north side of Orange Beach so that they could um, get a lot of septic off of uh, off septic tanks and onto sewer. Um, the Alabama State Port Authority roll-on, roll-off facility. If you visited the port, that's the area where you can uh, really set that up to be a, a, an export export facility for all the auto manufacturing that's going on in uh, in Alabama. Right now, a lot of those vehicles are, are going to Savannah or Jacksonville to be exported uh, that, that are manufactured in Alabama. Now that the Port Authority has that facility, um, 
they're hoping to uh, garner some contracts to be able to export those vehicles from uh, Alabama State Port Authority. That was a very large project. We only provided partial funding. A lot of that was provided by the port. Um, the ADEM laboratory building uh, in Mobile uh, recently completed and cut the ribbon down there for their new facility. Um, Dolphin Island, there are about $100 million in projects that are happening on Dolphin Island, which is uh, really transformational for that barrier island down there, and, and I'd be glad to answer any questions about those. Um, and we're doing quite a bit of oyster reef restoration work uh, currently. And then these are projects that are starting soon. You know, there's a, um, the Laguna Cove public access in Gulf Shores is going to be a, a nice public access facility down West Beach uh, on, between Little Lagoon and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, they're projects that don't seem all that exciting, like the Northwest uh, Satsuma water and sewer improvements. Those are very important to the community in Satsuma for them to be able to get a lot of their folks off of septic onto sewer, extend the, uh, the water. Uh, we did, did a great project in uh, Mount Vernon for uh, water distribution where they needed to be able to get to a lot of new communities as, as they have grown up there. Uh, sanitary sewer overflows in Fairhope, a plan um, that includes some drainage basins and some other things to keep having uh, sewer overflows yeah, in, in Fairhope. And then the, the uh, Tolman Springs and Gumstreams branch in Pritchard, there's, that's an area that I had the opportunity to visit uh, recently um, with um, a couple of our uh, folks down in South Mo in, um, in Mobile County. Took a look at that. That was in need of some, some restoration work in Pritchard to keep um, sewage and, and stormwater from flowing directly into Mobile River, then down into Mobile Bay. So that is a much, much needed project that uh, will begin very soon. Engineering and design is almost done. And then uh, as we're getting here towards the end, um, yesterday I had the opportunity to be down in Mobile with Governor Ivey as she announced uh, $30.4 million in GOMESA projects uh, through the Department of Conservation. GOMESA, or Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, that is revenue sharing that we get from offshore oil and gas revenues in the Gulf of Mexico. Us. Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas all share in those revenues. Um, it is an inverse proportion. Uh, every will in the Gulf of Mexico, we get a little bit of money off of that annually. Even if it's at the very far south of Texas in Brownsville, or whether it's right off of our coast, we share in the revenues from that. And it depends on how close that well is to our state for how much we get. It's a very complicated formula. But this year, um, you know, we governor provided $30.4 million in those projects that were announced yesterday. Had a great, great turnout. Just last year, we did $69.2 million in projects. So in the last two years, that's about $100 million in projects that we have funded in Mobile and Baldwin counties through uh, Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act. And uh, just as a refresher, y'all passed a bill a couple of years ago that mandated that that money could only be spent in Mobile and Baldwin counties before anybody asked me about a project outside of those two counties with these funds. That is, uh, the legislature passed a, uh, y'all passed a piece of legislation that limited where those can be spent. Uh, I get asked all the time about why we can't do this and can't do that there, so I just wanted to uh, hit that up front. Uh, but there's some really really good projects. The themes of the projects this year were nature-based environmental education so that people can, can see what they do, uh, how what they do impacts our, our natural resources and our waterways. We have a project in Orange Beach at the Sea, Sand, and Stars Center, at the Explorium in downtown Mobile, at the Maritime Museum of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, the Aquarium of, the, uh, of Alabama down there, and then the University of South Alabama for an outdoor classroom uh, on the north side of Dolphin Island that, that's going to be very popular. And then uh, there were some water quality projects, a lot of septic uh, improvements, sewer improvements, sorry, sewer improvements uh, uh, in these projects. And then one project that I'm most excited about is building a miracle field in Somerdale, Alabama, where people of all abilities will be able to uh, play baseball and softball. And uh, you know, that was really a, a project that I thought was a, of interest, something we didn't really have in, um, in South Alabama. Uh, for, for people to be able to do that. So I'm looking forward to, to that project being completed. And you can see the rest of the projects that I listed for you that were announced yesterday. Almost done. Uh, just a couple of other points of interest. Um, we had a, a project that was in partnership with the um, 
Coastal Alabama Partnership and the Alabama Historical Commission to look at ecotourism opportunities in the Black Belt and how we can uh, take advantage of what we have to offer in that part of our state and link it to some things that we'd already done in coastal Alabama. Uh, we have that report. We're working now on trying to uh, implement some recommendations from that report. I met with uh, Wiley Blankenship, no relation, uh, yesterday afternoon when I was down in Mobile uh, and, and talked through some of the uh, recommendations from that report and how we can, can better uh, do, do things in the Black Belt to get people there to take advantage of those ecotourism opportunities. Uh, we're doing feral hog removals on Forever Wild and ADC in our properties. I've gotten some questions about that from several members of the legislature. Uh, the Forever Wild board voted to spend about a million dollars out of the stewardship fund to uh, eradicate, eradicate hogs on some of the Forever Wild properties, and uh, so that's underway now. We have a pilot permit system that we're, we're implementing so that people during the deer season can still hunt hogs and coyotes at night. Uh, that was a request that I'd gotten from uh, the, uh, the Conservation Ag Committees uh, of both the House and the Senate. So we're putting that in place. Uh, that will be in place before uh, October 1st when hunting season starts, and we'll see how that works this year if we can allow people to do that, hunt those hogs at night while still uh, being able to take care of night hunting for deer and, and uh, make sure our, they're not running our game wardens uh, crazy all night long shooting hogs. Well, I think we have a system in place that'll make it where we can, can allow, can handle both. Um, and uh, as we've talked about in the past, as we try and manage species, different things, as we find more opportunity to allow more access to our citizens, whether that's for deer or turkeys or uh, red snapper or, or, or bass, we try and find ways for people to, you know, to be, for us to be less restrictive and still maintain the healthy populations. With that said, we're expanding the alligator season by about 190% in 2025, adding more tags, adding more areas because we've had um, a healthy population of alligators and we feel like we can almost double the take in, uh, in alligators and in, in doing, doing all of that in conjunction with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and our federal partners since, it does, since alligators still do have uh, a national and international protections. CWD, uh, chronic wasting disease, is still confined into a small area in Lauderdale County. Uh, I'm very thankful that several years after the first positive, we, um, we, we do have about three more positives, but they're all right in that same area in, in Lauderdale County. It has not expanded from there. Um, the Reservoir Management Program, that is uh, uh, legislation that was passed a couple of years ago that adds $5 to the boat, boating registration that goes into the Reservoir Management Fund for us to be able to uh, grant that out to communities like on um, uh, Lake Gunnersville and you know, for some, some of the grass that they have that, that uh, can help pay for some of the eradication of that, some marine debris removal, uh, marking of um, some navigation aids. We've just been collecting that money for the last two years till it could get to a level that we would have a, a, enough money for an adequate grants program, and we plan to uh, start distributing those funds in 25. Uh, we were able to do that because Senator Shelby was very gracious at providing some money to TVA and to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do a lot of that work on uh, Lake Gunnersville for a couple of years while, while this uh, reservoir management fund built up to a place that we could do the grants. And then um, we cut a ribbon uh, a couple weeks ago in Garden City on a new canoe kayak launch and new fire station in Garden City. Um, we have some other projects coming up in Colony and Forks in the River. That is from um, restoration funds from the Tyson rendering plant spill that happened several years ago. Um, so we're do, doing that work. We're not just doing restoration work on the coast. We do have opportunities as well when um, there are environmental things that take place that we have the uh, opportunity to hold the responsible party responsible and uh, take some funding from the settlement with that and do good work for public access or whatever it is to help give the public uh, reparations in what happened in those communities. And so those, that's taking place. Uh, Deputy Poulos is handling, Deputy Commissioner Poulos is handling all of that. Uh, he's the chairman of that committee uh, in those, those two counties to put that together. So any questions you got about that, I'm gonna defer to him because uh, he handles, handles all of that. And then uh, last but not least, you know, these are our, our outdoor recreation goals. And some of these I've already talked about, but just want to let you know what we're looking at as a department as we uh, do some strategic planning 
And as we have done for the last eight years, we've been very intentional about the things we're trying to do in the department to provide opportunities for the public and to be good stewards of the money that we have. I uh, talked about the improved boating access, creation of the shooting sports trail, more public hunting opportunities. Uh, we're, we know trail building, trailhead amenities, um, you know, for all those type of trails uh, is a, an important thing for the state of Alabama. We have the opportunity to take advantage of our outdoor recreational assets, to use that to re retract and attain talent, uh, to provide good quality of life for our citizens, and, to, and provide those, those, opportunity, those uh, outdoor recreational opportunities. That, you know, we've gotten some money uh, through Innovate Alabama uh, that, that was appropriated by the legislature through Innovate to do some good work. We're doing about a, about a million dollars of improvements on the Pinhoti Trail uh, to try and bring that up to a recreational um, scenic trail standard and get that designation for the whole trail, not just small, small sections of it, uh, and upgrade and retrofits to ex existing outdoor recreational infrastructure. At Oak Mountain State Park in, Birmingham, in, in the Shelby County area, at Coldwater Mountain in Anniston, we are uh, investing about a million dollars at each place uh, with Innovate funds to be able to, to uh, add to those mountain biking trails and the amenities and facilities they have there to get that up to the International Mountain Bike Association silver designation, which we don't have any of those really in our part of the southeast. Uh, getting that EMBA silver or gold designation is really going to uh, separate us and bring people into Alabama to ride those trails, uh, spend money, uh, and then and, and really help us as we try and uh, sell Alabama to people out of state and change the perception of what some people think about Alabama. Uh, and in that, I hope that you'll go to uh, seekalabama.com, seekalabama.com. That was an initiative that we did working through uh, Innovate Alabama to, take, to do an asset inventory of all of the recreational assets we have in Alabama, to put it in one website, to use that as a toolkit, not only for economic developers, developers as they could take that back as they're doing economic development work and trying to attract companies, uh, that they could show what we have in Alabama for those assets because it's become uh, very important for the new generation of workers and for these companies. They not only want health, good schools, good health care, you know, low cost of living, but they want opportunities for their employees to have a good quality of life. And, uh, the Lord has richly blessed us in Alabama from one end of the state to the other with uh, natural beauty, a bunch of water, and great opportunities to do things outside. So we have in trying to put all that in one place uh, so that, that they can use that, so that our citizens can find these trails and find opportunities without having to go to five or six different websites to find it. You can go to seekalabama.com and be able to find all of that on that site. Uh, and you know, we wanted to create that brand for outdoor, outdoor Alabama create that brand for outdoor recreation, and we've done that. Seek Alabama is the, uh, the brand, working with Big Communications out of Birmingham to uh, develop that and then market that. And uh, I guess that's it. Uh, I'll, if you've got more questions, just ask me or Deputy Commissioner. I'll do my best to, to answer them. Thank you all for letting me ramble on for a few minutes uh, and, and share the good work of our staff. Commissioner, thank you. Just a couple of comments. So, so some of us uh, were with you uh, th this past week, and we saw a lot of what we saw in this presentation uh, firsthand. It's amazing. I didn't really uh, understand that all that work was going on, and, and certainly it looks like you got a, got a funding mechanism for, for several years to come. So appreciate your work and your staff and, and, and what you're doing. And, and I know that... So, you know, we've got a lot of initiatives going on with trails, and I know at least these two chairmen sitting up here, uh, we continue to believe that you have got to be in the middle of that conversation on, on all these initiatives. And, and the same way, I saw some projects on here where, where some member asks, we get a lot of member asks, we, we get a lot of constituent ask, and uh, I assure you that at least from these committees, we always try to send them back through you. You've got to be at the, at the core of that. We're not going to try to initiate something without it being part of, of what your plan is and what you bring forward to the legislature. So uh, any, any other members have any comments or questions? Representative Witt. Just a question, and since you brought it up, the Gold Mesa, Mesa funds, I think, $30 million, and they're limited to the Mobile, Baldwin counties. What about the deep water horizon? It is uh, limited. I just thought I'd be asking. Sure. It, Tennessee River does run. It does run all the way down there, doesn't it? Well, it we, there in a roundabout, in a roundabout way. way, it helps. So uh, Those funds, um, by the Restore Act that was passed by Congress, are limited to, uh, it's essentially Mobile and Baldwin counties. It's a, like a 10-meter a contour that does sneak up a little bit into Escambia County, but not very far, but it is limited to, the, to that coastal area. And those funds are for capital expenditures. That they're not going into your operating, regular operating oh, no. expenditures so, or anything. That's a very good question. We, I, 
we run a very lean uh, operation uh, to, to manage that billion dollars in funding. Uh, we have six employees that do that. Two of those were reassigned uh, from from some additional from additional uh, something they were doing before, and then we've added four four staff members. So really, we're managing that billion dollars and all those 176 projects with six people. We do uh, uh, get the direct cost for those employees through the different funding sources, but that's uh, but that's it. There's not a uh, a set administrative fee for us to manage that. Mr. Senator Coleman Madison. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Blankenship, I just want to ask, do you all partner with cities uh, and, and counties that have recreational trails, for instance, like we have the Red Mountain Trail in Birmingham that runs through several municipalities. We have the Village Creek Project that has some 44 miles, uh, Turkey Creek. You know, there are others, mm -hmm. and all of these are, are recreational facilities that people enjoy. Uh, do you all work with them in facilitating and do you offer any any particular grants or anything that they might be able to apply sure. through the Department of Conservation? That's a complicated question and I'll answer it best I can. So um, like Turkey Creek um, um, is, is a, uh, uh, we have some Forever Wild property that is part of that and so we've built trails on the Forever, War Forever Wild portion of the property there at Turkey Creek. Uh, same thing at Tanny Hill State Park. Um, we've built a bunch of trails on, on the Forever Wild portion of that and partnered with them. We don't necessarily have funds that are available generally through the Department of Conservation to build trails on other people's facilities. Usually that's just on our parks or on Forever Wild. However, through Innovate Alabama, we have been, uh, we are setting up a grant program that will be um, coming out in early 2025 to be able to do that. Uh, to do it through Innovate Alabama to partner with those communities uh, to build to build trails and do other work uh, through that Innovate Alabama Outdoor Recreation Council, which I uh, serve as the chair of. Sending them a text message right now. <laughs> Any other questions? Commissioner, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all. To the members of uh, House and Senate, thank you for, for uh, being here today and supporting uh, the, the this being the fourth. Uh, we'll call the summer series of, of uh, budget meetings, and uh, I, I think it's been very beneficial to get a snapshot of what we may see in, in 2026. Uh, we'll, we'll let it play out now, and I think most of the executive uh, budgets are, are due uh, to the executive office around November the 1st, and so uh, we'll, we'll, try, we'll discuss dates and reconvene probably uh, in, in the first or second week of January, so we'll, we'll follow up and let you know on that. Thank you all.